Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Policy Central, your one-step destination at all things policy. Today we have on our panel Professor Prithvi Raj Singh, Professor uh, in MAPP and Faculty in Department of Professional Studies, Santu and Bhavika and me, Prajakta Mukherjee. So today we will be talk talking about uh, a very controversial and uh, interesting and a complex topic, the Citizenship Amendment Act that has been sparking debate all over India. Now, I'd like to ask Prithvi sir about the act. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, friends, uh, 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 we are seeing a lot of protests against uh, the newly uh, created rules under the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. We must understand here that uh, this rule, the first thing that, uh, or the onset I should say, that this rule, this law is to give citizenship, not to take away citizenship, especially to those religious persecuted minorities from the three theocratic uh, neighbors of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, which faced religious persecution for many decades, right? And this persecution was based on religion, right? Now, uh, uh, so therefore, naturally, I mean, they, they, they have to, uh, they would be coming to their natural home, which is India, because uh, we are talking about the undivided India and the newly created Pakistan, East Pakistan, right? So they decided to enter into India without any documents, right? And therefore, they can be uh, can be categorized as illegal migrants because they didn't have any documents when they entered into the country. Now, the major protest behind this law is that it is violating Article 14 because it is just you know keeping the religious persecuted minorities of Christians, uh, Hindus, Sikh, Parsi, Jain, and Buddhist, but it is excluding Muslims. We should understand, and therefore, the protest is that it is in violation of Article 14, which is uh, right to equality, right? But then we must understand that it has two uh, uh, parts. This article has two parts, equality before and equal protection of laws, yeah. right? Uh, now, the Muslims, which came from the three, uh, theo I mean, which are there in three theocratic nations, are not being persecuted based on their religion because they are the majority in the uh, Islamic uh, countries, right? So they were not being persecuted based on their religion. Uh, uh, and as far as the uh, persecution of some segments of Muslims are is considered in, let's say, Pakistan, if I talk especially about Ahmadiyas and Hazara uh, Muslims, now they are facing, facing not religious persecution, we must understand, they are facing sectarian uh, violence, right? And in fact, the Second Constitution Amendment Act of Pakistan itself do not, you know, tell, uh, do not declare Ahmadiyas as Muslims. Plus, if Ahmadiyyas would uh, uh, like to, you know, go, uh, flee from the persecution, which is sectarian persecution, and this law is for to protect, to give citizenship to religious persecuted minorities, they would prefer going to Bahrain than coming to India, right? And most of the persecution which has happened uh, 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 to these communities, the data says that 75% of them were, you know, from Dalit community, from scheduled caste. So they were the underprivileged, they didn't have any voice, and they were the, they became easy targets, right? Uh, 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 in, uh, so, so in 1947, when the migration happened, there were uh, persecutions starting from there. Plus, friends, we must also understand, uh, because we can debate only when we have facts with us, right? In 1950, there was a pact signed by Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Liaquat Ali Khan, then head of the government, which clearly mentioned that we would be protecting our religious minorities. In India, we would be, because in India is majorly Hindu uh, dominate, uh, the, uh, the populated country. So we would be, you know, protecting our religious minorities. But then what happened in our uh, neighbors is reverse, is opposite. Pakistan, when it was being created in 1947, the population of uh, minorities was 22%. Today, it has reduced to less than 2%. The same if I talk about Bangladesh, it was around 30%. It has been reduced to less than 5%. Afghanistan, again, from 50,000, today they are just 500 in number. So there is no doubt about the fact that the persecution didn't happen. It is still going on. Though today, if I talk about Bangladesh, after thankfully, after the Sheikh Hasina government, the uh, persecution has come down uh, substantially. But then, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, it is still continuing, right? And in the brief time or uh, 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 during, uh, you know, Taliban in 1996 till 2001, there has been large-scale, uh, you know, harassment and uh, uh, persecution and there are many incidents which are so horrifying women were being raped and they were being uh, 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 assaulted to such an extent that many you know pregnant women had abortion on the spot 
So there is no denying on the fact that the participation didn't happen. So naturally they would come to uh, the uh, their uh, India, which is a natural home, and and again we should also understand that it is not a first time that the citizenship has been given based on religion, right? Indira Gandhi government in 1970s did give citizenship to Hindus from Uganda, right? When they were being uh, asked by the head of the government to leave the country, Rajiv Gandhi gave citizenship to Sri Lankan Tamils in 1980s. Right. If I talk about, you know, because we should not have a parochial, we, we, we must go beyond our borders. And when we see the other countries like United States, like UK, they have also given citizenship based on, uh, you know, religious persecution. America has given citizenship to Jews who are being persecuted religiously uh, on religion lines. Right. Similarly, UK has also given to the migrants who were being slaves in those countries. Now, Article 14 as I, when I started my uh, discussion, as a protest is that Article 14 is being violated, we must understand that no fundamental right can be absolute, as Article 15 also is. And they do come with some reasonable restrictions. Now, when I say reasonable restriction, that means constitutional reasonable restrictions. Now, who would declare that these restrictions are fair or not? There are many judgments of the Apex Court, which has given some set of conditions or some set of tests, right? And the and if I talk about those tests, so whenever you are uh, infringing any fundamental right, specifically if I talk about Article 14, that why Muslims are not being included into citizenship law, and is it, it is, a, is it a violation of Article 14, we must understand that if it is an infringement or if it is a deviation, it has to fulfill or satisfy two conditions. The first is intelligible differentia. That means the differentiation that you have created between Muslims and non-Muslims, right? Does it have a reason? That is, does it have a reason uh, or logic, right? And as I said that Article 14 also include equal protection of laws. I cannot have the same law for a 15-year child and a 5-year child, right? So unequals have to be treated unequally. So equality applies to those who are equals, not to those who are non-equals. So, so because of the reason that they didn't face religious persecution to extent as the minorities faced in these theocratic nations. So therefore, it is satisfying the intelligible differentia test, number one. The second test is rational nexus. Now, rational nexus means that this differentiation that you have created has a nexus or has a connection to the objective to be achieved. Rational nexus, the rational or the logical connection, right? And the larger objective is to give citizenship or I would say to expedite or to fast track the citizenship process to the religiously persecuted minorities who entered into India on or before 31st December 2014. So this is a larger objective to give asylum, to give, recognize them as Indian nationals, right? So therefore, it is satisfying both the conditions of intelligible differentia as well as rational nexus. So therefore, to me, Article 14 is settled, right? Uh, uh, now, citizenship, as I said, that can be granted by various mechanisms. And uh, otherwise also, if any person want to acquire Indian citizenship, he or she can easily do so by following naturalization process. Now, naturalization process requires you to stay in the country for 11 years plus one year uh, for the uh, since the date of application, right? Just for, to expedite the citizenship process for religious persecuted minorities, this law was being created so that it would fast track the citizenship process from 11 years to five years, right? So this was the objective behind this law. Yes, Pradeep. Okay, now I would ask Bhavika to tell us about the current situation in Assam, Tripura, and how is CAA being implemented there? Okay, so before coming to the current situation in Assam or Tripura, we should look at the historical purview of the situation. Now, uh, we should know that uh, Assam as a territory has been a part of the British as well. So it was a constituency under the British. So in 1931, when census happened in Assam, uh, the census director of uh, the British government wrote a letter to British government telling that the demography of Assam has been totally altered due to this migration of either Rohingya Muslims or the people coming from Bangladesh. Now, coming to the current situation after partition, uh, in 1950s, the Nehru government applied, rather the Indira Gandhi government applied the IMDT Act in Assam, which was to find out the immigrants living in those countries and protect the rights of the indigenous people of Assam. So, 
in 2005 the very act the imdd act was struck down by uh, the supreme court as uh, supreme court as ultra virus why okay so the imdd act uh, had the onus of proof that the burden of proof was on the government to prove whether this person is their citizen or not while if you see the foreigners act that is other that is the act that has been used in other part of the countries to find out the immigrants in those uh, uh, states is uh, the foreigners act 1946 which uses that the onus of proof lies on the citizen to prove that whether he is a legitimate citizen of the country or an immigrant so this was raised by the asu all assam students union a lot of times the assam accord was signed but then also no action was taken so in 2005 the supreme court themselves took the action and said that imdd should not be applied in assam it is ultra virus and then foreigners act was applied to uh, assam so now what is the current state now this concert sorry the caa that is the citizenship amendment act uh, says that the inner line permit area in six scheduled states will be excluded by the uh, caa so we should understand that 30% of tripura that is the border line with tripura of tripura with bangladesh is excluded from ilp as well as uh, six scheduled and you see most of assam is also being excluded now all these immigrants living in these northeast northeastern states will not be given citizenship in other part of the northeastern states they will only be in, only be given citizenship in assam and tripura so assam and tripura as states have increased risk of these people pouring into their territories so as in states what will happen to the indigenous population the asu is anyways you know agitating the fact that uh, so many people are already there as immigrants and then if we keep on giving citizenship to these people what will happen to the indigenous population because they are also as you rightly pointed because they are tribal dominated regions right so they are afraid they are fearful of the fact that they would their language their culture would be you know destroyed or would be uh, you know degraded plus uh, their properties may might also be acquired by the the, the new the new citizens yes, right sir, yes, because sir. once you are declared as a citizen then you have a power over the property as well right true, true. so that is the fear of uh, the indigenous population, uh, indigenous population. And so there is also the exploitation of these immigrants uh, over the indigenous tribes like as we see in tripura yes so uh, recently the tripura accord was signed and so bhavika has the government uh, assured of any protection to uh, northeast sir all other states if we see have been protected but certain regions of assam are still not protected uh-huh. neither is tripura and if you see the nrc that happened in assam in 2019 left out 19 lakh people as immigrants first of all after other people who were included as migrants will be given the citizenship now what happens to the indigenous rights after that mm-hmm. already it's a northeastern high resourceful state mm-hmm. if more population is there more environment will be disturbed ecology will be disturbed Correct. what is going to happen we uh, there lies the question of that and then um, tripura if we see uh, has been voicing their opinions against bangladeshi hindus coming and you know particularly mm-hmm. asking for their rights there so mm-hmm. the government has still a lot to do and then when ca will be implemented they are saying that it will be linked with the nrc and uh, we have to take into the fact the consideration that in nrc in 2019 in assam there were cases where out of seven siblings six siblings were considered as uh, the citizens of assam while other one was left out because mm-hmm. of an anomaly so these anomalies are creating further situations for the administration in that mm-hmm. region mm-hmm. and it particular has to particularly has to be you know Addressed. taken into consideration by the government worked upon because without that we still are at uh, immigration crisis ca will not help until and unless these uh, administrative faults are you know taken care of so as a suggestion like there should be a body governing body mm. who can monitor all these facts would that be a the, better thing uh, the rules uh, recently have pointed out that mm-hmm. so there will be a empowered committee over that yeah but because they have taken out the district uh, authorities out of these uh, rules it will be difficult for them to be able to administer uh-huh. all of these policies But, uh, one fact to tell is that like most probably uh, even though there are bodies mm. uh, at the time of looking into the india's current situation or any other prospect is that corruption plays a major role true true yeah. india was 93rd so uh, i'll be coming up further with the example telling that how the things were hampered 
mm-hmm. as their job creation and fakely making their documents and becoming sure. the citizens but that is a fact so i think so the bodies need to be monitored and a strong body should be proposed as structural framework body should be proposed okay like. so i think uh, the government has uh, as far as the new rules are concerned earlier the power was with the district collector but now it has been given to the empowered committee mm-hmm. which has many members i think it has around 10 members right mm-hmm. so the body is there uh, 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 now that would have a final say right so in 2009 as far as the 2020 rules are concerned the 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 district collector had the say in uh, this process of identifying citizens but now it has been given to the empowered committee so i think the government is trying to create the structure which could you know fa- uh, structure the process i mean so process the I system mean to tell is, sir, it should be a corruption free structure yes yes all right okay uh, thank you bhavika thank you santu thank you sir um i would like to make a point uh, about the body that is being uh, formed by the central government uh, to look after the matter uh, so i would say uh, the district collector should be added in the body because he would know the uh, state better he would know the area better he would know about the vulnerable communities and uh, what all challenges can the body face because for example in west bengal if someone from a different state Mm. Uh, is in the body he might not know about the challenges mm. he can face so uh, to point over that the government has created a two tier system one at the district i mean one at the state uh, down going down to district level and one at the center right so at the district level the committee which is being created is called a district level committee dlc right which again has some state level officials which would be ascertaining the conditions and identifying the people who could be declared as citizens right and then they would send the documents to empowered committee right which would have a final uh, decision or a final say so in this way i you cannot we cannot completely say that the districts or the state governments are excluded from this process okay hmm. well so, in, yeah. mm, can i add to this point one thing is that the particular community we are focusing on giving the the status of ca we can make a head of it he can be the at least a uh, sub body he can come and communicate in a better way mm-hmm. that would go good in a way providing the documents and proofs and making them as a citizen or whether to not okay uh thank you sir thank you santu uh now i would like to speak about the current situation in west bengal and how different communities there are reacting to the announcement of caa on 11th of march so uh, basically i would focus on uh, two communities the rajbongshis and the matuas the matuas are basically a community of uh, it's a religious community of uh, shudras who had come to west bengal especially during 1947 and mostly during the 1971 bangladesh liberation war uh, they had come here just because of uh, religious prosecution uh, they were as sir had mentioned earlier they faced different atrocities in east uh, east pakistan uh then is east pakistan and uh, they were forced to leave uh, their own country their own land their own jobs and everything and come here and take shelter so basically the this community is uh, based in uh, the nadia district uh, purbo bardhman south 24 parganas and kuch bihar so uh, uh, the matuas have actually supported uh, the C, uh, the caa and in 2019 the current government had uh, promised the community that they will uh, the ca will be implemented and uh, they will be benefited from that uh, the leader of uh, all uh, all india matua mahasangha he said that it's a second independence day for the matua community and even after 100 years uh, maybe this government won't be there then but no one will question the refugees anymore and these are basically the bengali refugees who had come so uh, i think the matuas are supporting it and uh, in many ways they even here they have faced uh, certain difficulties uh, like coming from there settling here with nothing you're 100% right because the if you check the number of applications for citizenship for seeking citizenship of india 75% of them are coming from scheduled caste community yes. right and matua is a is a very big number in uh, bengal right so they also migrated from bangladesh because of the religious persecution yes sir you're absolutely right they are the second largest uh, 
SE community in West Bengal. They constitute about 15% of uh, the total uh, SE population. Now, I would like to speak about the indigenous community uh, that was already there in West Bengal. Uh, they basically are the Rajbongshis and they are settled in North Bengal. So, they are the largest scheduled caste group in West Bengal and constitute about 30% of the total uh, population there. So, uh, basically, what they want is they don't want CAA, uh, but they are more, they are supporting uh, the NRC more. The reason for this is, uh, as we know, uh, they are in the North Bengal and it has been a porous border. So, the intruders have come in and they have settled in their land. So, their main grievance is uh, before 1971, their population was almost, as per the reports or as per they say, about 80% of the population was Rajbongshis in North Bengal. But after 1971, that population concentration has gone down to 30%. Thus, it has led them to lose their land, jobs, rights, and al also a cultural uh, change has happened. So, th this is basically uh, what their grievance is. And also, uh, I would like to say, uh, back when the elections were happening, uh, uh, the current government, uh, a minister had promised for a different union uh, territory for the seven districts in West Bengal, uh, in North Bengal, and uh, they were promised that. So that had that has not been implemented yet, and that is one more grievance. And uh, also, as Bhavika had mentioned, no protection has been given to the indigenous tribe there as well. They should the the uh, the leaders of the different communities the there are different communities as well. Uh, they are saying that you know the government should have approached us, spoken to our people, and then have taken a decision because we are losing our identity, which is true which is because I, I would not like someone to settle in my land take away my job which is which is absolutely correct but also i can't deny uh, the matua community who have faced religious prosecution in east pakistan and uh, they have settled here so i think every community in west bengal the people who, who have are having their opinions they are correct it's a it's a very gray area i would say to uh, talk about and uh, we can't actually say that someone is right and someone is wrong in supporting or not supporting the CA. I would say that um, I live in a place uh, in West Bengal uh, because I often visit. It's a native, my, it's my native place, not 24 Parganas, and it's a very historical place. We all know the Battle of Lazi and other things also took place there. So there, uh, I live in the Bishpur area. It's my village name. So from Bishpur to Bangladesh border, it's a waterways, so uh, it is only hardly 8 to 9 kilometers of distance. And there is trading allowed, trading in the sense fishers go catch fish and there is an open space where they go to Bangladesh market, they sell. What they do is, every kind of business happens there. So in 1971, 1981, all in 1971 to 81, 10 years of phase, because my father says that, because uh, he said me that. There were only 2,000 population of Indians living there. But in this 10 years of this gap, the population raised up to 8,000. Into, dividing into different villages. Mm -hmm. Like, our Gram Panchayat consists of 12 village groups. Okay. So, what happened? The remaining people came from where, was the question. Okay. Few migrated from other uh, districts to this district and nearly 2000 plus populations migrated from Bangladesh. My grandpa who used to work in uh, electric department of this uh, state. He was an active politician also those time at that time. So there was a quote told by him and there was a statement told to my dad telling that they came here, they took the job, they took everything and today they are in the highest position was serving as a government employee. Either the established businessman or they have occupied the land. So what happened to the peoples living there? There is a tribe, Sardar tribe. Those who are like excluded from all the sections. They were into cultivation, farming. Today, they have to borrow land or uh, like they have to pay rents for doing the cultivation. What happened to them? So, this all issues have been faced in that village today's time. Hmm. Yeah. 
and the that particular place is extremely powerful with the particular political leaders and particular re- religion there so now when the cwa would grant citizenship to uh, these people mm-hmm. these migrants mm-hmm. don't you think that it would lead to further uh, you know uh, deprivation of the property jobs yeah exactly culture? So. exactly so it's happening but uh, the people there they are thinking like they are they are going to oppose to the government and tell that at least there should be a proper uh, structural body it is really very interesting that we have people from bengal uh, talking about their concerns in their state right uh, but bhavika when you talk about the larger picture uh, in india mm-hmm. how uh, uh, you know people are uh, seeing it uh, uh, because of course bengal is a, has a border sharing with bangladesh west bengal and assam north east state so what is the what are the other uh, would you, you see the situation or the state in india so uh, again going to the historical perspective one thing we have to understand is uh, our country was divided within days mm. based on religion based on religion. religion based on religion so religion partition always, happened based on religion so religion is not a new thing religion has always been there since the division of this country so one thing is sure that you have a complex history when you have a complex history complex situations arise and it is a, it is not a big deal good administration can solve those issues but the thing is that it should, it should take into account advices from all the regions that is necessary now uh, we talked about the eastern pakistan as in bangladesh there is also the west pakistan and how people from there had already migrated by 1947 so northern part of india doesn't face so much of a crisis as the eastern part does be the right. borders are properly demarcated there are fenced properly in the uh, yes. present pakistan uh, but it's porous in yes, bangladesh true. india yeah. so and uh, yesterday there was news that uh, the andabad government had given 12 uh, pakistani muslims or oh, sorry hindus citizenship uh, under this act ca so it does have its good sides it does have its bad sides one thing we always have to keep in mind it is not a present issue it's been there for decades decades and to solve it it will take decades so one one day one discussion will not solve the issue so an open minded discussions on these issues open minded administration and then uh, fixing out the flaws very necessary and uh, the government also said that apart from giving these illegal migrants uh, hindus and all the persecuted minorities the government the, a question or an opposition that was been raised to this act was why you not taking into account jews why you not taking into account atheists agnostics uh, one reason could be first of all is that when we think about policy policy is not always made of thought it has to be practical and on the ground so sure. so we know that uh, i read an article uh, yesterday saying that pakistani there are two sides to it pakistani jews some articles say there are no self identifying pakistani jews today some identicals some Id- articles say that they are living but hiding their identities so no one knows how many jews are actually living in pakistan and bangladesh and uh, when it comes to atheists and agnostics you need to understand that these are theocratic nations the moment someone declares themselves as agnostic atheists they are under the threat of persecution to which the government has replied that they will also take into consideration a case to case basis giving a uh, uh, citizenship to those people who have left their countries in grievous circumstances apart from the minorities so that also has to be taken into account and <clears throat> we have to uh, see that uh, when the nehru government in 1950s was this issue was raised that there is increased migration from pakistan and bangladesh they introduced something called as the permit system that permit system also gave uh, gave a kind of a platform for My minorities the persecuted minorities to enter india but they were also taking into consideration some grievous cases where uh, they were being persecuted other than religion so it has there has been a historical perspective to that question and then yes we can find the solution but it will take more time in the coming time so as uh, you rightly pointed that uh, in fact if i talk about the persecution which is which is happening or which happened in these theocratic uh, countries uh like jews are being persecuted uh shias uh, which is also a bigger chunk of uh, muslim community so they would prefer for example the shia persecuted shias would prefer going to iran which is the spiritual home yeah. of shia people yeah. then coming to india similarly jews would uh, like to go to israel, israel. 
then coming to India, mm. as Ahmadiyas uh, would like to go to you know Bahrain. Bahrain. So again, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, as a country, we have to look from the broader perspective, but we cannot welcome all. all. Given, the given the population explosion, sir. Right, in right. In the country, you cannot give. You don't have given. You have not given. From persecution, because persecution religion is one of one of the biggest okay, factor okay. of persecution, right? And yeah. it's happening across the globe. So we cannot invite all yeah, the people. Uh, yes, exactly. Right. Because uh, again, uh, we know the employment rate in, in unemployment rate in India. Yeah. So if we are welcoming everyone, mm. then we have to give them employment. We have to give them food. We have a surplus food, but again. Welcoming so many people, we can uh, fall short. We have huge administrative challenges, problems. Exactly, exactly, sir. So I think uh, what the government is doing right now, based on certain uh, religion, I think it's a good start. Sure. It's a good start, but I think again the eastern side of the country, like West Bengal, Assam, they need a special care because a policy, a policy for all, like which is which has to be implemented all over India. In it's a very complex nation. It should not be one size fits all strategy. Yeah. It exactly, should, it's they should look into the uh, micromanaging part of micro it. Micromanaging. Yeah. The North East need a special focus at least for this, like mm-hmm. this this apart from all. Uh-huh. If we want to protect the indigenous, indigenous community. community. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Great. So now I would like to ask Santu, uh, that why only Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan? Why not Nepal? Why not Bhutan? Why not Sri Myanmar? Sri Lanka. Uh, absolutely right, sir. Uh, see, in this uh, act of CAA of 2019, they have mentioned that uh, CAA takes count of the refugees from the territories that were separated in uh, 1947, basically. So, C only A addresses the Greater India of 1947. And uh, it's why Afghanistan, even though it's separated from India in 1876 because of the Durant Line Agreement, and uh, uh, there was a gap and there were trades and there were certain communities they were living there and they used to pass around so it didn't have much effect on it but nepal in uh, 1904 got totally separated okay with the particular treaties signed by the british government and the nepal revolution movement people bhutan was separated in uh, 1906 tibet in 1907 sri lanka in 1935 we all know that the conflict of interest took place and they were separated and Myanmar in 1937, the Burma province was separated totally by the British and giving them the separate nation. So basically, the CA is focused from 1947. So that 1947 thing took place and we know that East Pakistan and West Pakistan, East Pakistan is today a Bangladesh and West Pakistan is Pakistan. the Pakistan and uh, the Afghanistan. So these three had connections with us until our independence. So we just thought to include them only and not furthermore anyone Fair. so if we look in future cases we may get into it but this is a good start as Prajukta mentioned it before yeah. great thank you Santu uh, that was a very valuable information uh, now I would ask Bhavika do you want to add anything any more points to this uh, there have been also you know concerns regarding the Rohingya Muslims which have migrated from Bangladesh to our country now again the historical perspective uh, perspective on that situation would be that uh, after the separation of Burma state uh, Rohingya Muslims were living in Burma and when uh, the government there uh, threw, threw away basically Rohingya Muslims from their country <coughs> they took refuge in Bangladesh but we also know that the lack of resources in Bangladesh and uh, um, the country's population density pushed them out of Bangla- uh, Bangladesh again and pushed them to India now, one thing we need to understand that after they were pushed from Bangladesh, it is not ex- directly religious persecution that we're fearing. So, definitely not in the inclusion of what the CAA has been talking about. Now, coming to the administrative uh, problems today, we hope that when the Supreme Court hears on this issue, they talk about the progressive inclusion of all the non-including minorities here. And then we go- inclusively... Uh, move towards uh, the protection of rights of the Indian religious tribes and also humanitarian causes like these and settling what our predecessors what uh, the nation had done 70 years ago we hope to clear it and one day get a solution yeah thank you Bhavika oh sir 
Would you like to add something? Uh, so I believe that uh, uh, CAA uh, was an unfinished task of partition. Yes. It was a promise that the lawmakers made to the Constituent Assembly and the, uh, to protect the minorities and to take care of their interests. So I believe that CAA is a step in the right direction. And as Bhavika rightly pointed that no policy can be perfect on the, uh, the day of its inception. It takes time. It evolves with time. It grows with time, right? As the constitution keeps on growing, right? It's, yeah. it's flexible, yeah. right? And all the uh, grievances of many communities, people from Bengal, Assam, had, would find their reflection into the act, I believe. And I'm hopeful for that. And with this, we would have some uh, good policy solution in the coming future. Thank you, sir. So that's all for today. And uh, let's see how the government implements uh, the CA, how different states react in the future. So that's all. Thank you.